And I think we're going. Excellent. Fantastic. All right, it's been a busy week this week. Am I the only one who's had a busy week or everyone's had a busy week? Life gets busy, doesn't it? We had a, a busy day last Friday. We, uh, we finished building our chicken coop. I was, I was very proud of myself, so most of the things are fairly level, most of the uprights. The, uh, the concrete has, has stayed pretty much in place. The, uh, the wire is now sparrow proof, so we've got a lot of very upset sparrows at our house because I don't get a free feed anymore. But I discovered something. I discovered that as a builder, I make a really good pasta. <laughs> <laughs> but it's good to do things around the house and do things for yourself. Do you remember when we used to do all the things for ourselves? We still do. Still do, yeah. A lot of us still do. When we used to change our own tap washers. Or if something was broken, we'd fix it, wouldn't we? Now, I saw a, uh, a cartoon on the internet uh, during the week and it had two cars and it was like an old 1960s Holden and a brand new Mercedes Benz and the one guy on the 60s Holden was saying, you know, you put in your oil filter, it'll do another 2,000 k's. And the, the guy in the Merc says, something's broken, time to buy a new one. <laughs> and that seems to be the, the story of our lives. We seem to have forgotten how to do things ourselves a lot of the time. It's like we don't do things. We, we outsource a lot of our things in our lives, don't we? You know, we? We look to other people to do things for us all the time. And when we consider things that we need in our lives, we, I said we outsource. We look for other people. Can you just turn the mic down a little bit? We, we outsource to people who've got Ishan on the end of their names. We outsource the leadership of our countries to politicians, to all of our moral decisions and our... Um, our decisions about what we can and can't do as a community to politicians. We outsource the education of our children to the education department. We forget that it's actually our responsibility. All these things we outsource, we give to other people these responsibilities and these jobs instead of doing it ourselves. And today we're looking at what practical Christianity is. And I wonder if sometimes we don't outsource our Christianity to others. We don't outsource our religion to others. And religion's almost a dirty word these days, isn't it? I remember hearing stories from my grandmother uh, about the Depression. Now, some of us, not many of us, will be old enough to remember the Depression of the 20s and 30s. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to put up your hands. But she tells a story about in the, in the Depression in Queensland, they would have people who'd come to their door and they were on a, uh, a farm out in Esk. Does anyone know where Esk is? Yep. Yeah, it's west of Brisbane. And people would come to the door, these, these swaggies would come to the door, and for a cup of tea and a couple of bickies, they'd sit there and they'd make pegs out of fencing wire. Some of the, the clothes pegs. Does anyone remember them? I think mum's still got some somewhere. And they'd do odd jobs, they'd do little bits and pieces, and as a, someone who, who had their own property and lived on the land, you would help your neighbour. If these people came, even if you didn't need anything, You'd give them a cup of tea and a meal and a bed to sleep in the, in the barn if they, that's what happened. And just for the sake of them helping you a little bit so that they had some value, you'd help them out. And we do that as a community. But we've outsourced that now. We outsource that to Centrelink. We outsource it to the Salvos. In a lot of ways, we don't actually do a lot of that ourselves, do we? We expect the government and the community to, to, uh, to do that for us. I remember being in America. Now, nothing against Americans. I'm not making eye contact with anyone, by the way. But when I was in America in the early 90s, I worked on the, uh, a cargo ship. And one of the things we, as Australians, and I was the first Australian there, but we were quickly joined, actually. Funny story, which I'm going to tell. It's got nothing to do with the sermon. I had a guy come. The, the captain came down and said, we've got a new Australian coming. Um, we thought we'd, you'd like to go and meet him at the train. And his name's Kiwi. <laughs> He's not Australian, I can tell you that now. Close. Close, yeah. I won't tell you the rest of the story. That'll, that'll be another day, all right? But in, in America, we discovered that we as Australians could, could do certain things that the Americans couldn't do. And we could see a problem and we could fix the problem without the right tools. You know yourself that if you don't have the right tools, what do you do? 
you find something that'll do, won't you? You get the next best thing. You know the right tool for the right job? Well, everything's the right job for some tools. Now, say if it doesn't, if it doesn't work, you get a bigger hammer. Yeah. We, we, we would do that. We'd find other ways of, of fixing the problem. But because America had become so specialised in everything they did, they would look and they'd go, that's broken, we can't fix it because we don't have this tool, we'll throw it out and get another one. And it's sad that we as Australians are actually going the same way as a, as a community. You know, we say well, we don't have the right tool or the right equipment to do this job, so therefore we can't do the job. Well, no, you find a way around it and you make it work. And that's one of the things that made Australia great. Maybe I should run for politics with this speech, I don't know. But <laughs> it's what made our country great is that we could fix things, we could do things we thought outside the box because we had to. See, we live in a world now which is post-enlightenment. We are post-Renaissance. We are post-industrial. And we are post-modern. So we've got all these things in our history which have isolated us from our community and from being very general in how we do things. And we've become specialists. You know, as a pastor I stand up and I'm supposed to be a specialist in this. What are you laughing at? <laughs> I'm supposed to be a specialist in the Word of God and interpreting. And I should know a fair bit about it. I mean, I've studied it. I should know Greek and Hebrew and all of these things, which, which I do. But I'm a specialist in this and I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be a specialist in caring for people and when people say, you know, there's a crisis in my family, I'm supposed to know how to deal with those things. Let me tell you, there is no Bible college course that equips, equips you for that. There's just nothing. You pray really hard, that's the only thing you can do. And we specialise and we outsource our theology to people like me. And we say, oh, the pastor said that, so that's what we're going to do. The pastor said that we should believe this, so we'll, we'll do that. Or the theologian who wrote a book and is published, said we should believe this. So we're going to believe this. And in some respects that's true. I mean, if I had a problem with my electrical at home, I wouldn't fix it myself. All right? I've got no hair to stand on end, but it would if I, if I tried that. All right? You outsource to some specialised things. But you also don't go, there's a problem with the light bulb, I'll call an electrician, what do you do? And you put it back in, don't you? I'm trying to think of a good light bulb joke, but I can't think of one. So... But we outsource all of this stuff and we, we look to experts for advice but then we don't go the next step and actually imply it ourselves, do we? Everything's become very theoretical for us. And we look at our Christianity and our beliefs and our faith, it also has become very theoretical. We believe a whole lot of things. Let's just go back one step and we'll define something. Let's define what being a Christian is. How do we define being a Christian? We would define it by somebody who puts their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour, wouldn't we? That's how we would define it. But that's because we are postmodern, post Christendom, post Enlightenment, post all of these things. We're, we're living in a time where we are told that it's all about belief and faith. Now, don't get me wrong, I believe that that is the basis of everything that we, that we are. Your Christianity is based on whether you trust Jesus or not. You can't earn it. You can't make, earn your way to heaven. Nothing you do will make you a Christian. However, you can't be a Christian without doing certain things. Let me say that again. You can't be a Christian without doing certain things. And there's a reason for that. Martin Luther. You know who Martin Luther was? Not Martin Luther King Jr. That's a different guy. Martin Luther used to consider the book of James. He wanted to remove it from the Bible. He said it is called, it's the paper gospel. He didn't like it because it talked about works and it was the basis of a lot of the teaching about works in the Catholic Church at that time. So he wanted to remove it and he said, it's all about faith, it's not about works. And he was right, it is about faith. But James says this, we've just read a section of James, let me read another section. If you have your Bibles, open up to James. I'm going to be looking at James and 1 John today, so you can open to one of those. James 2, we read this, starting from verse 14. He says, What good is it, my brothers, if a man claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such a faith save him? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes or daily food. If one of you says to him, Go, I wish you well, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about his physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. That's a pretty harsh statement, isn't it? 
Faith by itself, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Now again, we're saved by faith. We know that. We're saved by God's grace. There's nothing we can do to improve on our salvation. But what we want in our lives is something which is living and active, don't we? A faith which is alive. We don't want a dead faith. See, faith is expressed in deeds. And if a faith is not expressed in what you do, it is not a real faith. It's not a living faith. So the question is, how does your faith change the way you live? If we're talking about practical Christianity and being a practical believer, how does it change the way you live? Does it change the way you live? See, we believe certain things. But I want to suggest that if we actually believe them, we do them. See, I'll say that I believe I should lose a few pounds. All right? Let's just get a side on for the camera. Right? <laughs> I believe I should lose a few pounds. However, if I actually believed that, I'd actually do it, wouldn't I? If I really believed that. Don't tell my wife. Right? <laughs> if I really believed it, I'd do it. Because I would put my faith into action. If we really believe what Jesus said, we would do it. One of the things as a, as a pastor, as a preacher... The easiest way to do a sermon is to look for a problem in the church and address it and try to fix it. Now, you guys make my life really hard when I preach this because I can't actually address this here. And let me tell you why. Because I actually see this here. I see faith in action here. They get a big head, all right? It's, it's not all you, it's Jesus, all right? But I actually see it here. I see us reaching out to the community. I see us caring for the disenfranchised, for the underprivileged. I see us partnering with other ministries and caring for each other and loving each other as a body. I see all of this. So in some ways, as I was writing the sermon, I'm thinking, is this the right sermon for this church? Well, I don't know, because I'm not actually addressing something which is deficient here. I'm addressing something which I see, but I want to encourage you in something. We turn to 1 John 4. John says this, we love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God. By loving God and carrying out his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. This is love for God, to obey his commands. See, as Christians we talk about having faith and we talk about it being a belief system, if you like, or it's more than that based on faith in Jesus Christ. But there is so much more to our lives, to our Christianity, than that. When the world sees us, they don't see our faith, do they? They don't see what we believe. They see what we do. And the command of God is to obey Him. Do you remember last week I talked about a Christian worldview? Do you remember that? I talked about how our worldview and how we see the world impacts everything about us. The fact that we have a Christian worldview, that we believe the Bible and we believe it from believing and living as God says, impacts our beliefs, but also impacts what we do to other people and with other people, how we see ourselves. It impacts our community and our, our, our politics and everything else. Every part of us it impacts because our worldview is the basis of the foundation for the rest of our lives. If that is true, which it is, by the way, the one I, I want to suggest that our faith changes who we are because our faith is the basis for our worldview. See, our faith and our belief in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as God incarnate, coming amongst us and walking amongst us, that changes who we are. It has to change who we are if it is real. See, faith is like a, like a virus. Let's call it that. Let's hope I get to the end of this analogy well. All right? It's like a virus. If you've been immunised and you get a virus, what happens? The virus dies, doesn't it? 
It dies. It becomes inert. It no longer affects your body. But if you get a virus and you are susceptible to that, what does it do to you? Basically, it changes who you are, doesn't it? It changes something about you. Now, let's say it's a virus like chicken pox. Has anyone ever had chicken pox? Most of us probably have. If you have chicken pox and people, you're walking down the street, people can see that you've got chicken pox, can't they? Yeah? And what do they do? <laughs> it's like Moses in the Red Sea. It's like, let my people go. <laughs> The people part ways, it affects how people react towards you. I want to suggest that our faith is like that. Our faith, not that it makes you sick and intolerable, that's not what I'm trying to say. Our faith affects who we are and it changes who we are and it changes how people see us. And if it doesn't, then you don't really have it. Now as a, as a man, I am susceptible to being ill, shall we say. Men or wives, you know what I'm talking about, don't you? As men, we get a cold and we're like, oh, I'm dying. Oh. The world is ending because I have a cold. <laughs> yeah, tough enough, that's it. Yeah. Women, you don't get that. You go, soldier on, we've got to get this stuff done, haven't we? All right? Guys, you know what I'm talking about too, admit it. All right? Do I get an amen from a wife? Yeah. You're not a wife, you can't say that. I'm not one like you. Your faith is, it affects you, it changes you, it infects you. Why do people get out of their way when you've got chicken pox? Because if you've got chicken pox, you will give it to someone else, won't you? Let's draw that analogy with your faith. If you have your faith, what will you do? You'll infect other people. In a good way. Because faith is infectious. Why is faith infectious? Because people see what we do. <coughs> They see our faith in action, our practical Christianity, and they go, I want me some of that. I want to be part of this because it is good. And there's some of the biggest comments that are made about Christianity. This is a study done in America. The three words which define the term Christian in popular understanding. Do you know what they were? What were they? Ask awesome. Judgmental. Judgmental. Anti-gay. I think the other one was intolerant. Yes. Judgmental, anti-gay, intolerant. There were the three things that popular understanding was about Christianity. I want to suggest that maybe we're getting it wrong somewhere. If that's how people see us, maybe we're doing something wrong. Now again, let me say... It's hard to preach a sermon like this in this church because I don't see that here. But I know that each one of us within us has the seed of this within us. The seed of this judgmentalism, the seed of this intolerance, the seed of this hatred towards others who are not like us. We have that within us at a very the part of our DNA almost. But I want to suggest that you are infected with something which overcomes that. And that infection is the love of Christ. And what we do, what we become, who we are as people and as a community is changed by that infection. Today I want to ask you, are you infectious? If there was a, a thought police or a mind police out there, uh, what do they call them, the... Uh, CBC? No. The d disease control people. What are they called? No one knows. I don't know either. Center for, Center for Disease Control. C CDC. Center for Disease Control. If there was one of those about, um, about being good, would they come knocking on your door? If there was a thought control police saying, we want to describe our Christianity... We want to get rid of this because we want everyone to go this way instead of going the way that God says. Would they come knocking on your door? If the answer is no, then you're not infectious enough. You need to go and spend some time getting reinfected. Because our practical Christianity is what transforms the world in Acts. We're told this, and I'm going to finish with this, I hope. In Acts, we're told this. The, the apostles go out and they go to this particular place. I'm not sure exactly the place now, I can't remember. 
But the people who were in that town complained to the, uh, the government. They said, these men who have turned the world upside down have now come here. These men who are spreading this infection, this infection of the love of God, have come here. What are we going to do about it? I want to suggest that if we are really believing what's in here, we're going to do it. Let me read one more verse and then I want to pray. 1 John 5, 3 says this, This is love for God, to obey his commands. And his commands are not burdensome, for everyone born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that has overcome the world, even our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world? Only he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. Do you believe that? Do you live it? That's my encouragement for you this week. Continue doing those good things we are doing, but go beyond that. Go out and spread this. Go out and be infectious in the community because that's what's going to transform our world. Can we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you that you came and you infected us with your love. That you came and you poured your love upon us. And because of that, we exhibit your love to a world who don't know you. Lord, as we go out into the world this week, help us to be infectious. Help us to be transformational in the world. We know it's your love which transforms this world, Lord, but help us to be agents of that. This morning, Lord, my prayer is that we will know you and in knowing you, we will become more like you. That we will not outsource anything of our lives to anyone else. But that we will rely solely on you working in us to achieve that transformation. I guess, Lord, more than anything, my prayer is that you will draw us closer to you. Make us more like you, Lord Jesus. Amen.